Okay, when we're talking about resources, use of resources in church planting, uh, we need to talk about the concept of indigeneity. Uh, it's an old concept. It was really came to be developed in the 19th century missions movement where for the most part Western missionaries were going to other parts of the world and planting churches that they looked very foreign. They looked like Western churches, but they didn't really fit in very well to the cultural context. And so the question came to arise, how can we plant churches that fit into the context? And so when we talk about indigeneity, we're talking about something that's natural, native, rooted sort of in the soil. We might say that a, uh, a green pine tree is indigenous to northern climates where there's certain type of soil. If you took that pine tree and you tried to plant it in the desert, it wouldn't live very long. It's not indigenous to the desert. On the other hand, if you took a cactus that grows well in the desert, you transplant that and put it in the northern cold climates, it's probably going to die. And so the idea of indigeneity is to plant the church often in a different culture in a way that that church becomes naturally rooted in that culture. It's still countercultural. It's still a sign of the kingdom uh, in the values of the kingdom and the gospel, but it grows in that culture in a natural sort of way. And so part of the problem when we use outside resources is that we have a lot of outside influence and there is a temptation then maybe to develop that church in a way that it won't really survive and sink roots and grow healthy in that context without continually bringing the outside influence. For example, if I took that, that pine tree and I planted it in the desert, if I just kept watering it all the time, watering it every day, putting fertilizer, I could probably keep that alive in the desert, right? For a while. For a while. <laughs> Might still die. You're an agriculturalist. so. Um, but I'd have to keep constantly bringing in something that's not natural to that environment. And so we want to learn to how to plant churches so that they will thrive in what's natural in that environment. And I believe that God made the church flexible so that it can thrive in any environment without constantly having to import a lot of extra outside resources to keep it alive. Now the original idea that was developed by Venn and Anderson was called the three self goal of missions. Basically that says when you plant the church you want it to be self propagating. In other words, it's not always the outside missionary that has to do the evangelism, but the church, the people, the local people start doing evangelism. And so that church reproduces itself from the local people. Self governing, that you don't have a foreigner that's leading the church and making the decisions but you raise up local people who become the leaders, the pastors, the elders, and so on. And self-supporting, so that it's not dependent on financial resources constantly coming in to pay the bills, but the people are committed to owning and making the sacrifices necessary for that church to survive in its own environment with those resources that are there. So this was the old three self definition. It has certain problems. Uh, but at the same time, it had a certain value. If we want to reproduce churches, if we want to reproduce pine trees, we can't just keep importing more water and more soil and more fertilizer into the desert. No, we've got to find out ways that it can thrive. Now, maybe that first church that's planted is going to need some extra help to get started, but quickly we want that to be able to thrive on what is there. Now, Paul Hebert, an uh, anthropologist and missiologist, uh, suggested what he called a fourth self, and that was what he called self-theologizing. Now, what does that mean? It means that that church not only is sort of sustained by the local resources and so on, but that church is able to read the Bible and apply the Bible and able to answer the questions theologically, biblically that it faces. In other words, it doesn't have to be dependent on outside teachers telling it what to believe and so on. Some of you will be familiar with this concept of three self from uh, the People's Republic of China. And ironically enough, that uh, when the communist government took over in uh, mainland China, they said the churches need to become three self churches. Um, they didn't want outside influence. They didn't want Westerners somehow subversively influencing the Chinese people. 
Of course, there was a lot more to that story than meets the eye, and we don't have time to tell that story here. But uh, <clears throat> the irony of it is is some of those three self-churches are actually the least contextualized, uh, and some of those uh, so-called underground, unofficial churches were really much more natural and reproduced in the true sense of the three self. But that's another story. So the idea was here that the church needs to contextualize. It needs to be able to create its own life in that environment creatively. And this is the beauty. Some religions like Islam are very uniform, or at least they, in theory, want to be uniform. Everybody has an Arabic Quran, and the law of Sharia is the same everywhere, and the forms of worship are the same. Many religions are like that, but Christianity is not. Christianity can change its shape and to different cultures. It's the same gospel, it's the same kingdom values, but it takes different expression, just as we saw Jerusalem church, Gentile church, and some of those different forms in the New Testament. And so uh, churches need to be well contextualized if they're really going to thrive and reproduce and um, develop their own sustainability on their own resources. And so church multiplication ultimately needs to depend on those locally renewable resources. Uh, just like that pine tree is not going to make it, we need cactus or cacti that are in the desert that will be able to sustain and reproduce in that environment. And as long as a church is constantly dependent on external assistance, it's going to be very, very difficult for that church to reproduce. Now let's talk about six different keys, what I call to sustainability in church multiplication. The first is the movement has got to be spirit-filled and mission-driven. In other words, we can have all the best methods in the world, but if the, if the believers don't have a passion for Jesus, if they don't have that love for God and a love for the lost people that they are willing to sacrifice, they're willing to do whatever it takes, they're willing to be committed to the cause because God has put it in their hearts, that, pro, that, that is not really going to naturally reproduce. Local believers need to have a sense of ownership of that ministry. We've talked about this repeatedly, that they have the sense we're the people of God. God has given us a mission. This is not just the mission from somebody in America or, or somebody in Germany or somebody from some other place. No, God has made us the people. He's given us the Great Commission. The Great Commission reads the same in Russian. It reads the same in Arabic. It reads the same in Tajik. Whatever your language is, the Great Commission is for believers. And when that strikes, that hits like a bomb. When a people realize we're the next in line. The baton has been passed to us. That spirit-filled sense of mission and local believers sense that and are committed. As we've said, we need to model ministry in ways that can be easily reproduced so that new believers who are less trained and don't have years and years and years of Christian experience can repeat that, as we said, with Bible storing or other methods that are easily reproduced. Developing and empowering and releasing local workers. This was one of the challenges that historically missionaries have tended to do outside missionaries. They start, they plant the church, they lead people to Christ and say, well, the people aren't far enough along yet. They still need my help. They still need our help. And not really entrusting the people to the Holy Spirit. Of course, giving them basic tools of ministry and basic understanding of Scripture, but ultimately entrusting those people to the Lord, equipping them and releasing them and saying, now you serve, you follow God's leading. You're the people of God. You have the Holy Spirit. Teach tithing and sacrificial giving from the start. So there's that sense of commitment that this is just a part of the DNA of our movement. People make the commitment necessary, the financial commitment included to make it happen. And so missionaries, uh, subsidies, other outside resources, they should serve to sort of jumpstart a movement, but not sustain a movement. Now there's a big difference. You know, how long would you just keep pushing that car? Eventually, you would say, we've got to get a motor so that car can run on its own, right? That's really vintage P. 
People's Republic of Germany right there, that photo. Um, eventually, that car's got to have a motor that runs. We're not going to just keep pushing with, with outside power. Or you say, okay, we're going to jump start that. We get out the jump cables, attach those cables. You start up the motor. Do you leave the cables on? You take the cables off. You gave it enough juice to get the motor going, and now it should be able to run on its own, right? Now, if you took the cables off, and immediately the motor died. Put the cables back on again, motor starts up. Take the cables off, motor dies. How many times would you keep doing that? You'd say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with the electrical system. We've generated something, whatever it is, we've got to fix it. Because ultimately, it needs to be able to run on its own. The jumper cables helped get it going, but that's what they're there for. And that's the way we view initial outside assistance, whether it's in the form of a missionary, whether it's in the form of financial assistance, uh, whether there's teams coming in from the outside. Those should serve to jumpstart a movement but we need to ultimately have that movement that runs on its own power of God, runs on those resources that are there. And you say, well, we don't have many resources. Maybe they're more than you think. Maybe you don't need as much money as you thought you need. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Well, sometimes we have to be creative, but I believe God has given every church resources to be able to reproduce. You know, even the poorest in the people reproduce children. Isn't that something? <laughs> Spiritual children can be reproduced also with very, very few resources if we just Believe it and go, don't get sidetracked. Uh, you can go on YouTube and you can find this video. I won't play it for you. But this is a Volkswagen Taurig. Uh, and believe it or not, and that's a 747 jetliner. Now, that little Taurig is hooked up, and believe it or not, that car is strong enough, it can pull the 747 down the runway. Isn't that amazing? Now, how long do you think it's going to be until that 747 takes off? So we may be very impressed with that little Volkswagen, but at the end of the day, that Volkswagen is not going to get that airplane in the air, right? And sometimes I get the feeling that uh, sometimes churches are so enthusiastic about giving and helping and helping, they're not thinking long term. Will that movement ever take off? Sooner or later, you got to start the motor on the 747. Then it's going to be able to take off. And that's the way we've got to be thinking. What is there? What has God put in those people? What has God put in that location that can be set free to launch a movement that will be able to sustain itself? Nobody wants to be on life support forever, right? And sometimes we create churches that are sick and they're dependent. And then it's very easy for them to get in sort of a self-pity sort of mode and say, well, woe is me. You know, I, I don't have what I need and, I, and we're poor. And if we only had more of this and, and we become sort of like an invalid that's on life support. Now, sometimes life support is necessary to get a person through a crisis. But we certainly... Hope people don't have to stay on life support indefinitely. And a church should not have to be on life support indefinitely either if it's going to be a healthy one.